for the time. Tea time. Yeah. This is tea time. Yeah. Make a difference. One cup at a time. Tea time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Making a difference. One cup at a time. Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, it's evening tea time. And tonight I am joined with Candice uh, McPhee. She is here and we're gonna be talking about her books called uh, Finding Color and Life Strikes Back and a couple other books and all that good stuff. And we're gonna talk about her tea tonight. And her tea tonight is tenacious, uh, enthusiastic and adventurous. So before we get started and start serving you a good cup of tea in a different way with Miss Liz, we're gonna get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel and ring that little doorbell so you can subscribe um, and be notified when all these incredible tea times are up and live. So you can listen to them in the morning, afternoon, evening, in your car, in your home, at an event, all of that good stuff. Um, and if a tea time resonates with you, please share it with uh, your loved ones and friends because that's what these tea times are for is to help other ones connect and resonate with. And we have some incredible books so you can get some Christmas shopping done because Christmas is coming. Yes, Miss Liz mentioned the word Christmas. Um, so we're going to get that all out there for you guys. Um, so let's get the disclaimer going. Then I'm going to do Candace's uh, bio and then we're going to get Candace in here. And we're going to spill some tea with you guys. Uh, and you do not need to drink tea with tea time with Miss Liz. You can have a glass of water, a glass of juice, coffee, tea, glass of wine, whatever you feel comfortable drinking. So the disclaimer for Miss Liz is tea time live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any tea time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward for may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that this show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later during time. And again, all tea time shows are done on Thursdays, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you see tea time on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, it's a surprise team, uh, surprise tea time, special tea time, or rescheduled tea time. Uh, Miss Liz just does that. I'm just all over there. So you'll get Miss Liz anytime. So now a little bit about my incredible guest who's waiting in the background. Cadence is born in Montreal, Quebec. She spent years backpacking and working around the world. She has a Bachelor of Commer Commerce degree on MBA and worked for 20 years on four different continents and now calls Calgary, Alberta home. She got married, had kids, and things got busy. Time was moving by quickly, and her kids were growing up fast. She shifted gears and quit, quit her job to spend time at home. During COVID lockdown, she had time on her, on her hands and decided to try writing and started writing the Back in the Year series. When she's not at her computer yelling just a few more pages, then she'll make dinner. She loves hiking in the Rocky Mountains, hot yoga, reading romance novels, and making up new cake recipes, especially like Slav and spend time with her husband, the self-proclaimed grumpy motherfucker, and my three awesome kids. And yes, Miss Liz will put the explicit out there because I think it's pretty cool that we can swear once in a while. It, releases the endorphins let me get kate and candace in here and let's spill some tea together welcome candace thank you hi 
I, you know, when I always open up, I have a moat full of words, right? And it's just like blah, 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 and it just falls. Um, so I really want to thank you for joining me tonight on Tea Time, uh, Candace. Let's start with who was Candace as a little girl and who is Candace now? Oh, okay. Uh, little girl and now is not terribly different, I have to say. Um, I was always laughing, probably maybe a little bit more uh, super naive as a kid and probably still a bit naive, but I kind of enjoy that. Um, just likes to play, likes to have fun and just doesn't take things too seriously, appreciates what I have. And to be fair, it's pretty similar now. I have a, I have a thing I like to do with people I meet when I first meet them and because it kind of gets me to know folks a little bit. And I ask, um, what's your inside age? So my inside age is 13. So I feel still 13. But do you have an age that pops out to your mind? For me, nine. Nine? That's I don't know why. That just popped in my head. It's just like nine? I, what then, happened to me at nine? I'm not even sure. Yeah. Well, some people are old souls, right? Like my younger brother said he was, he when he was 20, he said, oh, I'm 45. Everyone has an age inside. And um, yeah, 13 was my age. I had to sort of play with it a bit, but yeah. So not too, not too dissimilar, to be honest. Wow. And you caught me off guard. I, I don't know why the number nine, I like the age nine. You know what? It is what it is. And if number nine is a good age, then you just like to kick back and skip and, you know, stop and smell the flowers and maybe get distracted a bit and just have fun. Wow. You know, I've never been asked that question. So thanks for asking that. Though. So <laughs> I want, I want to get, I want to get into your tea right away. Cause I, I feel like my own is telling me to get to your tea right away. So the word tenacious, enthusiastic mm -hmm. and adventurous. Tell me mm -hmm. why those three words. Tenacious for me has always been sort of that, like it, I didn't even, I remember it took me until probably I was about 25 till I even understood what the word meant. And then when I really understood it, I went, okay, I get that word. I am that word. I, I don't let things go. Um, I'm, when I was working in a, in the corporate world, I was famous for my drive-bys. I would kind of saddle up to my VP and say, so, and he'd go, oh, okay what and i'd have to sort of just to think about it you know and i would i would come at it from a different angle i always think that if you um if i truly believe something needs to happen and it's and i'm not getting any momentum i feel that i have framed my argument wrong so i need to do whatever i can to sort of bring it up. So I need to reframe it. I need to reword it. I need to put the problem differently. I need to communicate it differently, whether it's maybe I'm talking, maybe I need to present something, like however I need to do it. And I feel that, I feel this drive inside that if I don't continue, then I'm really letting the team down, whatever the team is. It could be something at work. It could be some way we need to work as a family. It could be, I don't know, that someone needs a party. I don't know whatever it is. If I truly believe in the inside that something needs to happen, I will push, 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 but you know, not so that you want to clobber me, but get to a point where I have done everything I can. And then if I get shut down, then, okay, I, you know, I feel like I've relinquished it and you, you have acknowledged me and said, I hear you. It's not happening. Then I'll go, okay, great. Um, I'm out, you know, but I won't stop at once. So that tenacious part is, is speaks to me quite, quite, quite succinctly. Um, enthusiastic. I've always been enthusiastic. I think things are much more fun. You know, we, um, for example, I have three kids and they make so much laundry. It's out of control. Like they all play sports. They all do stuff. There's so much laundry and we have this landing pad right outside the bedrooms and it, it's like laundry mountain by the end of the week because and people when I see the kids starting to pick I know we need to fold them right so I make it fun I say okay laundry folding party you know and everyone comes in and we have we have a tea session we have a conversation we sit around on the floor and we throw laundry at each other we have enough I have loads of laundry baskets so everyone has a basket they can bring to their room but we make that fun so for me even the crappiest things can be fun 
So that's where my enthusiastic part comes from. And adventurous, uh, I think it, it stems to my books as well. I've always wanted to see and experience stuff. I'm, I'm a touchy person. I need to do it myself. I need to feel it myself. You can tell me about something and I will appreciate your story and I will listen and ooh and on ah all the right places. But for me to truly get something and um, I just need to jump right in and do it. And that goes from, from you know, directions. Well, you know, I'm just going to give it a go. Um, I really like those directions now, how a lot of companies are getting to a point where they have the one like direction, there's like seven points. And then there's the big book, like the big book does not get cracked open. I'll do, I'll do the short one and then use the course. I just need to kind of get into it and experience and touch it. So those are mine. That's my tea. Candice, and I really love that you said the big book is too much, right? Like, you know, <laughs> keep it simple, keep it fun. Keep, you know, when we give it too much, then we're like, oh, I don't want to do this, right? It's mm -hmm. like laundry, mm -hmm. right? I don't want to do it. But we, make I know. Fun of, we make fun of it, right? And yeah, I, I, I like that, you know, folding parties. And I need to, I need <laughs> to encourage my grandkids to be doing that. I mean, folding parties with mom and dad. You know, because I don't want to fold everything. I have to do the processing, but I'm not a folder. So everyone can be accountable for their own folding, but we actually make fun. It's 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 actually something, it's it's a half an hour I look forward to with my kids, which is very authentic. And um, and we laugh and joke and make fun of each other. And so to me, it's those small things, right? You could go on the most luxurious holiday or have the most crazy adventure or spend a zillion dollars on something but it's those moments to me that are the most precious anyways that's just me right. it's the little things that are the big moments in life yeah so candace you you said something about tea sessions so is it like a tea conversation is it tea and cookies like how does your tea session work um with my kids yeah Oh, it's, I was saying it was like a tea session, like our conversation now, okay. we just download and I think that's when you get the most authentic. Um, I find I have the most authentic conversations with people when there's no script, we're driving in the car, we're going for a walk, we're folding laundry. That's when you get the good stuff, right? You, you know, if you're trying to set up a time to okay, you need to have a chat and... Uh, you know, and, and that's one of the things when you mentioned when I, I had left work, I was finding that I would come home at 7, 7.30 at night, and I was so burnt out. I didn't have any time for them. And they and by that point, they were well over whatever it was. Like, they've had hours since they've gotten home from school. And um, I was missing it, you know, and I just thought, I didn't have kids to have someone else raise them. I had a nanny, I had a cleaner, I had a gardener, I had someone to shovel my driveway. Like I had a whole bunch of stuff, but I didn't have that time with them. And it it um it got to a point where the money just wasn't worth it anymore. It I was just missing it and I thought I'm not I'm not doing that. I didn't I choose not to do that. So, yeah, but Kansas, I'm, I'm glad that you said that, you know, because I, I that, that's one of the biggest messages that I put out there, right? We make all this money, we get all these titles and all this success, but what sacrifices do we make to get that, right? It's ugly. You know, I, I just didn't, I didn't like who I was, you know, I would, I wouldn't like who I, at work, I was just straight, like, get, get it done. And then I come home and I, it, I couldn't shake that off. I would be the same way with my kids. I'd be very transactional, very, uh, you know, step by step and, and the same sort of, and, and uh, that's not the kind of parent I wanted to be. That's not the kind of, that's not the kind of values I wanted my kids to, to have, you know, just, Oh, well, I broke something by me another one. I'm like, Oh no, what do you mean buy you another one? Like you broke it. Like, <laughs> We need to, you know, no, <laughs> it's gone. But I was at the point where it was easier just to buy them another one than listen to the moaning. But now we have different values. My kids, my kids talk differently. They're, they, they make conscious choices. It's not, it's not this sort of more, more, more thing that I had with them before. So, so you started this series when COVID came called back in this, back in the year. Is mm -hmm. that with all the five books that I found? Is that part of that series? 
Yes. The, so the series is called Back in a Year. And the reason it's called Back in a Year was it's kind of the last thing I said to my family. And um, when I left, I, you know, I was, I was living in Canada, not too far from where you are. I was living in Toronto and living this sort of punch the clock kind of life and going home to my little apartment and sitting and eating my sad meal for one. And I just thought, oh, geez, like, this is not this, this is not the life I want. And um, when I left to start this big backpacking adventure, sold everything and just said, okay, I'm going. And I was old. I was like 25 when I left. I'm like, Ooh. it's like people don't do that at 25. You know, you're, you know, people are getting married. They're settling down. I was just selling everything. And my dad's just like, what are you doing? But I just, I was so deeply unhappy and I just didn't feel that I could get out of it in in the path I was on. The path I was on was going to lead to me marrying some inappropriate person and living a really miserable life that I couldn't be tenacious, enthusiastic, adventurous, like that I would not be able to sort of live the way I wanted to. And um, yeah, so when I left, I, I packed everything and left and said to my uh, my dad and my brother, and I said, okay, I'll be back in a year. And they both were like, yeah, I don't know. I don't think so, but you go do you. And I wasn't back in a year, but that was, that was my understanding was that this was kind of, I'll be, uh, yeah, I'll be back. But um, I, but I kind of like it, right? Because at COVID time too, right? Back in a year, like we, we didn't know how long we were going to be locked in. Right. So yes, I kind of, I kind of like it back in a year. I'll see you in a year. Yeah. Yeah, I'll see you in the air. I'm just going to hang out in my house. Except there I was doing something much more fun. I was traveling around. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what they say, right? Take it and, like, and go MIA for at least six months and then come back and show them results, right? And and that's kind of what you did. You you went and started writing. Yeah, I did. It, you know, it took a lot more than six months. I, um, I, I... I should have written, if you had an E, I would have, oh, you did have an E. I could have put eco, I, eco, but I like enthusiastic better. I, I did not want to put out a crap book. So I refused to put my name on something um, that wasn't good. And I spent time, years, like literally years, um, revamping, reworking, working with people, developing the competency of a writer. Uh, you know, I like I said, I worked in the corporate world. I could spin up a PowerPoint like nobody's business, but to be able to tell a compelling story uh, was a skill I didn't have. And yeah. um, it was also very humbling because I thought I did have it and I didn't. Uh, I got some very kind, but... Um, uh, pinpointed feedback uh, on how I can improve. And I kept rewriting these books and I, I kept going with the same until the feedback became on the story rather than my writing style. So I got lots of feed feedback on, okay, you're, you're not, you should be doing more of this. It's too much of that. And until I was able to understand the nuances of, how to tell a compelling story, you know, how to dump a bunch of, you know, draggy words and how to really sort of ebb and flow and bring you into in a humorous way and experience way. And for me, it was interesting because I'm telling a story that actually happened to me, but it's like almost 30 years ago now. So I was a different person, different, just a whole whole level of third different level of 13 back there and um i just i i had to be able to find the balance between digging deep and sharing what was going on emotionally and explaining where you were without being a travel book and then making the story go along pretty quick right but my goal of these books is for you to take the trip. So I want you to be able to open the book and just get sucked in. Like you're there, backpack. You're, you're jumping there. like that rabbit hole kind of book, right? You're on the trains. You are, you are getting your ass grabbed. You are the one, you know, dealing with 
all of these different people, all these different languages and currencies and situations and funny things and crazy people, you get them all. And um, it, it just took a time to be able to do justice to the balance of all of that. And it, 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 took, it took time to learn how to do it. But I was very proud when I said, okay, and when I finally was working with someone and they gave me back the book and they said, okay, this is it. Like, this is your version. Like, just go do the changes that I, the, the changes that I've written about how to sort of zip the story together a little more compelling. But um, this is the story now, the way, you, you, the way you've written it, the way you sort of nuanced me through. There's lots of tangles and following all the threads and make sure they're all, I hate reading a book where, you know, they leave you hang, they say, oh, and I took my glass and put it down and thinking, oh, it's important glass. Okay, remember the glass. And then nothing happens with the glass. And you're like, damn you. And then you're like, what did you do with the glass? Like, where is did that? Did you wash it? Did you break it? Yeah. Where, where did it go? Was, was someone, like, did someone put poison in it? Like, what happened? So it was just, I, I was just very specific that I didn't want the reader to get distracted or have this moment where you pop out of the story i wanted you just to kind of get there and go and i've had a lot of feedback on finding colors specifically around folk just picking it up and just you know re just just getting through it so well i really like yeah. the titles of your books like you just mentioned one finding colors like how did you get the title of that book uh that book was um because that's kind of what happened during the story um the, the whole thing kicks off because my um, my mom got cancer when I was uh, in my teens, and um, uh, my whole family rallied and we looked after her until she died just before my twenty third birthday. So a lot of different type of growing up happened during that time period. There was a lot of experiences I missed, but a lot of experiences I had right, and I knew I only had a short time with her, so everything else got pushed away until you know we knew there was a time limit so we all just kind of rallied and 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 did what we had to do so we could be together as family and help her but after that because i spent so long as a caregiver you know there's so much of your time like if you were to draw a circle and say okay how much of your time is is a caregiver is one third of my time was being a caregiver and when you i was kind of like this rudderless boat just not sure what I wanted, who I was, just like like a lot of people at that age, nobody, like you're still figuring stuff out that I really didn't know. I didn't even know what chores I liked, like what hobbies I liked because I didn't have time for any. So um, that sort of deep sadness that I had was just sort of turned my world just gray. Like the moment she died, we were all with her and it just, it just turned down and it was, it was just the world just became very gray and very dull and every step was work and every moment was work. And I just didn't know what to do with myself. And that's what this book is about, this journey of, you know, taking a chance, finding, just saying, okay, I've always wanted to do this. I'm leaving. I'm going to go and do this. And throughout the book, there's lots of stuff that happens in the a lot of an idiot during the book, so I'm just putting that out there too. Um, but it's about finding who you are again and just being able to say, okay, I I can see it. There's color here. I I've got it. So that's what that's what that book is about. And it's funny though. But I like that you said that. You know, there's there's color here. I like that. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So you're. Yeah. The next book that I have here is Life Strikes Back. So was mm -hmm. that after Finding Colors? Yes. So that's book two is Life Strikes Back. And um, I, I just hear Darth Vader. And, like, oh, dun, dun, dun. and the things that happen in, in book two, it's this fast pace, this really like tough time because um, where it's it takes place in Russia and the Baltics and Poland. And it's just is these places that 30 years ago the tourists weren't as avidly there as they are now right i think the world's opened up a bit more people are sort of dipping their toes into different places but not many people were there and um 
it was very different back then traveling as a woman as well in terms of the challenges that you have as traveling as a woman. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, you are objectified a lot. There's a lot of sort of tricky personal situations that happen in this book. And um, it seemed to me, it's not darker, but it just seemed like, you know, when you watch Life Strikes Back, the movie, like, sorry, um, Empire Strikes Back, the movie. Yeah. Right? So it's like, what I loved about that movie was that the people, like, it was, it was bad, right? A lot of bad stuff. I have bawled my eyes out when Han Solo got turned into carpet, like just tears, right? But what made it so good was their friendships and their quips and the fact that it was fast and the fact that you did not get sucked down all the time, but it was this constant up and down, but it was still a challenge for the characters, right? It was their most challenging saga, if you will, but some people could argue, I'm sure. But to me, when you look at those three together, that book is the, it's so like, sorry, that movie. And to well, me, it's like, like that beginning of Dark Vader, right? Dun, dun, yeah. Dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like happening, right? And this, this book to me, the second book is very similar. It's, um, it's a tough time period uh, in terms of really just um, dealing with my, with this emptiness. So it's the emptiness of death. So Original book one deals with in terms of grief. Also, there's a boy and it's uh, gets yanked around a bit in book one. But that book one, Finding Color, is really about self discovery, whereas book two is digging deeper in terms of grief in this and just saying, oh, okay, so grief is heavy, but it's also empty, right? You have this emptiness that you just can't fill. It's like when you're thirsty and you drink a thousand drinks and just you just can't quench your thirst. And it's like this, this aching emptiness that is so heavy. And it's just this, this, and you just try to do whatever you can to, to get rid of it. But you just, it's just, it's work. You have to, you have to consciously sort of figure out what it is that you can do to, to, to climb out, you know? And that's what this book is. This book takes place, that's the personal journey, but it takes place around a bunch of physical challenges in terms of, it's just really hard to travel in those places. Being women traveling in those places, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's so much um, verbal assault, it's crazy. And there's also a sexual assault, there's like, but there's also the beauty of the funny things that happen. And I have a friend that I'm with and she's hilarious and she makes everything better. And we go through the crappiest things, but we still have fun at the end of the day. So it's, um, it's, it's this quick kind of up and down in terms of getting all the feels again. So that's oh what goodness. it is. I, I, I got to get this series because it sounds like <laughs> rabbit holes, like Alice in Wonderland, kind of like the feel, like, you know, like how I like to write. I like to get you in and just jump in the hole and see where it takes you, right? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and get, you, get your mind wondering, like, like, like you said with the glass, right? Where did the glass go? Who broke it? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did they put poison mm -hmm. in it? Did, they, did mm -hmm. somebody just take it out of the book? Like, you know, where that, mm -hmm. where'd that glass go? Uh, yeah. And I just love the titles of this whole series because you have Finding Colors and Life Strikes Back. Then I mm -hmm. have Hello, I Am Here. Like, it mm -hmm. just speaks to you, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's just like, okay, get the next book, get the next book. Like, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how did you come up with that one, Hello, I'm Here? Well, Hello, I'm Here is actually a very um, PG uh, shout out from the locals in Egypt. So... I never knew that many bad words until I went to Egypt in terms of all the things that were said to me. But one of the more pleasant ones that I did enjoy was when we would walk down the street, the men would say, hello, I'm here. So they would, they would want you to notice them. <laughs> so it's kind of, that's where the, the double entendre is, but it's also about myself too, in terms of, you know, just I'm here and I'm present and I'm doing this. So that's where, yeah. where that one comes from. Well, Candace, you mentioned something, traveling as a woman, 
especially mm -hmm. if you're traveling solo, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. There is a big fear. Um, a lot yeah. of risk. I, I didn't have enough fear, probably. I was probably a little bit too laissez-faire, especially when, again, what I like about this, you could almost classify as historical fiction now because it is 30 years ago. Um, there's no phones. Email is like, rare. If you want to, if you want to, you know, discover something about a place, um, you have a travel book, a lonely planet or a let's go and the sort of recommendations of other travelers, but you, you don't actually see anything until you get there. My whole world of uh, that inspired me to travel was National Geographic's and Indiana Jones movies because Indiana Jones has the best adventures and those adventures were like, they just, they, those kind of movies just didn't exist before. You know, there was that, that sort of real crisp adventure. So when I got to Cairo, I'm like, Indiana Jones has a lot of explaining to do because this is not Cairo. <laughs> it's kind of like Aswan, <laughs> but I was like, where is all this? The colorful markets. And anyways, I, I, it inspired me to be, Egypt was one of the places I was desperate to go. And um, I, I had always wanted to see the pyramids and take a camel to the pyramids. I was just like, okay, this is, this is happening for me. And um, it does in book, in book three. But um, so yeah, in in book four, it's beautiful warped. I think beautifully warped. Yeah. So book four is actually just a whole switch up again. It's a safari in Africa, oh, and I did a six Africa week. Now. I did a six week safari. I flew from Cairo to Nairobi, and I did an over. I overlanded from uh, Nairobi to Harare, and then then again down to south africa but this book actually is this overland truck trip like i don't know if you've ever seen those big sort of rumbling trucks they're like a converted truck there was 27 people from all over the world and a handfuls of people knew each other but i was on my own and it's a crazy i i often think of i don't know if it's anthropology but an anthropologist would have been like oh my god study these people just thrown into this really tight situation where you're all intense and you all rely on each other for cooking there's not a lot of food because sometimes it's not it's not as easy to find food and just um looking at um falling in love with africa because that's what this book is it's africa to me i in my mind, I'd always, okay, Egypt and Australia were always my two, like, yeah. But Africa to me was this gift. It was such a surprise. Just the feeling of the place, it just, it just sinks into your bones and you just, it's, it's a whole different experience. And that's what this is. It's a, it's a, a love affair, if you will, with Africa and also a study of, <laughs> 30 crazy people stuck on this one tiny truck and trying to exist and living in tents and, and just, I had never camped before this. I had literally done, you know, the Labor Day, like, or the long weekend camping where you open the trunk and then you sort of put, put out and you maybe set up a little thing. I had never camped and um, I was quite keen to go to Africa and they said, Oh, uh, there's, there's bush camping. <laughs> and I thought, Oh, bush camping like isn't all camping bush camping i didn't get it i didn't get that bush camping was when you're just there with nothing um i they said oh bring some wipes for bush camping and i had to buy wipes in cairo and the only wipes they had was rose scented wipes Have you ever use rose scented wipes while you're actually dirty like red dust dirty with your rose scented wipes you smell like a like a, I'm, you know, like an unwashed granny. Like it's just like it's just <laughs> really bad not. cup of tea. <laughs> really bad cup of tea. Like a dirty, rosy cup of tea. And yeah, so it was. That's that's book four. So book four is all of that, and it's a whole love affair and a whole uh, experience that uh, like no other for me. Anyways, it was it was crazy wonderful. And book five is the landing place. Yes, so book five uh, takes place after the safari, and um, I ended up in uh, South 
in Johannesburg, uh, the book Five Stars in Johannesburg. Ironically, this is really strange. In book one, I met this man at a bar on Canada Day in Moscow. And I was talking to him. He's an older gentleman. We're having a chat. And uh, he says, oh, I live in, <laughs> he's from Montreal. I'm from Montreal. We're both in Moscow. How cool is this? We'll have a chat. And he said, oh, well, he said, if you come to South Africa, let me know. And I said, I'm going to be in South Africa. And he goes, well, you know, he said, he wrote down this email and said, email me when, you know, when you're in town. So um, I did, I emailed him and he said, oh, I'm not going to be in town, but um, I'll just get one of my guys to come and get you. He ran a company or something. Anyways, I get picked up by this French Canadian dude in Johannesburg. Like, what? And he plays hockey. So on his balcony, there's a hockey bag. And I'm just like, what? So, so I went to a hockey game in Johannesburg where it was like the one arena in Johannesburg. And there's like a drip coming from the ceiling, making like a puddle right around the blue line, you know? And I just thought, okay, this is so bizarre. Anyways, that whole book starts there and it goes down the coast of South Africa, which is beautiful, and then up to Namibia. And then um, it goes to Australia and then back around to London again. So that's that one. Well, so all of your books take you on a real travel journey. Yes, you go right around the world, one time right around, oh. and um, you see everything. And I think for me, the most Inter well, there's a lot of interesting parts. I think some people might enjoy some places better because, oh, I went there and I really liked it, or I, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. But you, I come from this living in this one bedroom apartment, junior, junior one bedroom apartment in Toronto by my sad self, and leave and just go, okay, I'm going to do this, and I'm, I'm. I'm snotty. I'm kind of stuck up. I'm stuck in my ways. I, you know, I, I, I don't, I can't, I kind of feel like I maybe kind of feel like I'm owed something just because I, I could spend those years looking after someone else. This is my time, you know, but by the end of it, I kind of realize I grow and it's a whole different me and it's a whole different person and just, seeing the things I've seen, seeing how lucky I am and how fortunate I was to grow up in Canada and um, just to have that opportunity to even be able to do it, you know, just to be able to leave and go and um, have that time for myself, that gift of time. And I, I was, um, when in your life can you say, okay, I had a, I had, I had, a, I sold everything. So I had a pot of cash and I thought, okay, this is it. I have the time I have is this much cash. So it wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't time bound. I was cash bound. So everything I did, I did the cheapest way. Everything I did, if I could save a dollar by walking, I would walk. If I could save, you know, um, you know, by, I don't know, anything I could do in terms of making a sandwich instead of eating somewhere else or whatever it was, traveling third class everywhere I went, taking the, take the detour route because it's cheaper, whatever I could do, I would do to save money because that meant one more day at the end of it because I did not have a time bound thing. I, this was a money bound thing, which is different than most of your life, right? Because all your time, everything's so, okay, I have two weeks, let's see, are we doing all of it? Are we just sitting around? Like, what is, what are we, what are we achieving here? But it was such a gift because it yeah. was this, it was this open ended and I could just, just take a big, a big exhale and just do it. So, you know, I think that's something that we really need to look into, right? Is money mapping, you know, because we could travel a lot of more locations and enjoy the scenery by making a sandwich instead of eating at a seven course meal, right? Like that just gives us three extra days in this location. Yes. Like, yes. And, and it was, it was like that. And even just getting places I had an around the world airline ticket, it was much cheaper. It was, it was a much cheaper way to travel. And then in between I would overland, whether it would be 
Um, there's some places where taxi was cheaper, like in Egypt, or overlanding on a train or a bus or whatever, and what never terribly pleasant experiences, but uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was um, it was whole different. I remember I was in um, uh, in book five. I was in Namibia, and I was uh, taking a train back to Vintuk. I was on the coast, and um, I was sitting there chatting with these two local girls. They're I don't know, maybe fifteen or something, and they had never heard of the internet. So I was trying to explain the internet to someone who didn't again, 30 years ago, uh, someone who didn't understand the internet. So trying to explain the concept, and I had a bad chocolate bar, and I was sharing my bad chocolate bar. Their uncle was over with them, just waiting a couple feet away, and they were waiting for their mom to come in on the train. And um, across the train track from us was the desert train, which looked like the um, the Orient Express. I could seriously see these people in, um, they were sitting at a table, this like a uh, older couple her hair was done just so she had like a really quite bougie scarf on and he looked like he had a jacket on they had flowers on the table they're just cutting their steak and i'm sitting there sharing my chocolate bar on the you know on the on the platform and um it was just this and i i just thought i thought to me i remember thinking to myself thinking oh i would not be them. It just looked so stuffy and it looked so um just I just I could smell the fresh air. I could smell the sand in the desert. I could smell it all. I could, you know, could feel everything and it just I just did not want what they had. So anyways, that's where I enjoyed my cheap travel. So <laughs> so Candace, we have uh, we have a couple questions here. Your traveling experience, did that help with writing your books? Oh, my travel experience is the book. So that's the basis of the books. And that's um, that's the sort of back. I don't even know if you would call it the backbone or the plate or the icing on top. I'm not quite sure. Because if you if you want to, the over arc story of the book is this, uh, the development of the main character and the growth and dealing with grief and understanding yourself. Um, but it happens within the frame of traveling. And the... I've only sort of spot like I feel like it's kind of like if everything's a flat playing field and you know you things pop up so what's in the story is only the best of the best of all the things that happen so you get to kind of go through I was very specific on pacing in terms of I wanted people to I want you to experience like what it's like to be on that dusty train platform or what it's like to be on that bus that smells like mildew or you know how how many how bad the shocks were or whatever it is but you don't need to have it every time so there's just the best of those stories that kind of bring you through um the overarching thing so the travel is it i used to avidly journal i would write down every it's a nerd at heart right here so uh i got a write it all down and um it's all in the journals like the not the book but what happened so and the story is different than what happened so in the journal is what happened but the story is what i've been writing and what age group is your books made for um you know it's terrible isn't it i would say anything over 18. I haven't let my kids read again. They don't really want to, but fair. Um, I think it's an interest level too. I think folks over 40 would probably find it pretty interesting, but I have also given it to a lot of younger folks who've liked it as well. Um, we went on a big holiday last summer and I had a suitcase full of my books and I would leave them all over at different hostels and stuff when we were away. And I had a, and I would leave my contact details in the books and a number of travelers email me and say, oh my God, I loved your book. So, you know, it's been, it's been kind of neat. So younger folks have enjoyed it. Um, I kind of look at it as a category of, um, if you've taken the trip, but didn't write it down and want to remember if you didn't take the trip or if you're thinking of taking the trip, these are kind of the books you want to read, or you just want to think like a, it's just, then they're, they're, they're the kind of books that you can just pick up and just read and just enjoy. I have people say, oh, I've laughed out loud. And everyone has said they laughed out loud at different places. And there is, 
but also people say, oh my God, I bawled my eyes out. Or I just thought, wow, you know, there was parts that were emotional. There was parts that made me laugh and it was just, it was just a fun ride. So that's what I want people to have. Well, and I like it. Like I'll be back in a year, right? It just shows what you can do in a year. So yeah. how long did it take to write these five books? <sighs> Much longer than the trip. That's for sure. It's taken probably uh, a couple years for sure. And I've got two out and working my third one. Um, so yeah, way longer than the trip, <laughs> which I find is a bit ironic, but oh, well, I had to learn how to do it. So it's okay. So Candice, do you have any plans of writing any new books or a new series or traveling somewhere new or? Yeah. You know, I said my kids and I did a trip last summer and I had a, I had a vision that I thought, oh, it'd be really fun if we wrote like a family version book and thought, oh, it'd be fun, like a family trip. But I didn't feel it. You know, I, I think for me, writing these books um, has been on my mind for 30, since I've been taking the trip, I thought, oh, it'd be really fun to write about this, you know. But at that time, it was just a pipe dream. And um, I think it's kind of cool I have this like dream come true, which is kind of neat. Um, yeah. And I will probably do something completely different. Um, after these are done i am cutting my teeth on these ones but more than cutting my teeth i want to spin up a really amazing series people will enjoy and then i'd like to take that travel experience and probably apply it to some kind of mystery stuff so i'm feeling mystery uh, maybe some sort of sort of morally gray mysterious character who does international stuff and can go to the places i've been so maybe that's where we'll go mystery in the future mm -hmm. i want to get into the cake making because you mm -hmm. mentioned the backbone or the icing on the cake and i'm like and she creates these cakes so how do you yeah. how do you how do you get these cakes and how do you create okay. your cakes so this started when i had my second kid because he's allergic to so much stuff that i cried when i got back from yada so he's allergic to dairy eggs nuts seeds and randomly kiwi so I grew up on grilled cheese sandwiches and cheese casseroles. So this was a very big transition for me as a parent to learn how to read book. So I spent nights and nights walking the grocery store aisles, reading all the labels of stuff. And really the only thing he could eat off the shelf was Oreos and chips because Oreos are pretty much full of crap. No offense, Oreos, but they are. And chips. So I thought, okay, if I want this kid to be able to experience cake or experience cookies, I have to learn how to cook differently without eggs without dairy and how am I going to bake without eggs and without butter? So I just had to relearn how to cook stuff. And um, so I took my favorite recipes and reworked them. And I think my worst was like, I had an epic lemon cake fail that was really bad, but everything else was pretty good. We, uh, we ride the banana chocolate chip cake pretty hard and uh, pumpkin, pumpkin cake, because any kind of fruit-based cake is a nice replacer for eggs. Yeah. And the dairy supplements now, again, he's 17 now, but now there's lots of good dairy, op dairy supplement options. So you're kind of cooking with that, but the egg thing was a bit hard, like especially if you have four eggs in the recipe, gosh, it's oh, a lot of volume. How are you gonna make that up? So anyways, <laughs> I think my latest one, which was kind of met with a bit of <laughs> controversy was my orange date cake. Now I thought it looked pretty good, but I had a kind of mixed reviews on that. So yeah, I'm constantly just now, I, I'm actually half safe. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty proficient. I can kind of look and see what I've got and I can kind of whip up some sort of cake from pretty much anything. I can pretty much make a cake. So I couldn't go on one of those pretty baking shows where they do nice icing and stuff. That's not my jam, but I could whip up a nice cake for you. This I, just, uh, I, I was just it. watching this series on Netflix called Nailed It where they have uh, to make cake and I'm like, oh know, my goodness. Like, no. And they're like nailed it, and their eyes seems like all sideways and everything. And I was nailed like, it. You I know. Like a job. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, that would be what my icing would look like, but the cake would taste really good. And it would be dairy, egg, nut free. So <laughs> call me if you need any of those recipes about them. <laughs> so you're big on cake, right? Uh, I'm big on cake because I didn't want him to miss out. So we, we are a big cake family and, uh, there's always, my grandmother used to do pies. There was like 
stack those blueberry pies in the freezer. But for me, it's cake. There's always cake in the freezer. So anyone that pops over, there's always cake. Yeah. So what was your most outrageous cake you've made? Um, most outrageous cake. It was probably that orange date cake because I thought, I thought it was on to a winner. So I kind of like dates, but no, that was a bit, uh, that was, that was a bit controversial. Didn't have as many takers for, um, sort of that stuck around in the freezer for a while. My husband ate it when he was pretty desperate, but, uh, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> He's like, I want something sweet. I'm like, oh, orange date. He's like, dang it. Okay, fine. <laughs> have you ever had a cook-off in your house? A cook-off? No, but I'll just say my son is probably one of our best cooks just because um, I've got to, I got sandwich or two girls on either side and the son in the middle. But I've, I've really focused on him in terms of teaching him how to cook because um, because of all his allergies. I'm like, you need to, you're not the dude that can grab pizza after school. You got to. You got to learn how to make your own food. So we spent a lot of time teaching him how to cook. And he's, um, it's one of my, it's my daughter's birthday on the weekend and he's making cupcakes. So there you go. Oh, well, look at that. I know, I know. The start them off young. And, and then I you know. never know, you might have a future chef in the family, right? <laughs> Maybe. So you're no longer in Montreal, you're in Calgary. So what do you love about Calgary? Oh, those mountains. I don't know if you've seen them or if you've seen them in pictures, but in the pictures is exactly how they are. They are literally take my breath away. I have been living here for uh, almost 20 years. And every time I catch a glimpse of those, I see like the there we just had a rainstorm so they they're back to the snow but in the summer they're usually quite this like really different shades of uh, charcoal and gray um but when the snow peaks come oh so beautiful it is breathtaking you're not telling me you have snow already in calgary do you we did uh i haven't seen the mountains today but uh we had a really bad uh rainstorm last week and they had some snow peaks on there because uh because it's because the elevation were much more. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Wow. And mm -hmm. I, I really like that you had mentioned the Canadian dude. Like I was like, this girl is Canadian because <laughs> just the word dude, right? We us Canadian girls, <laughs> that's what we say. We, we say dude. <laughs> so, <true. laughs> so with your Canadian dude, do you have a favorite Canadian hockey team? Oh, it has to be the Canadians. I'm from Montreal, so <laughs> it doesn't change. Now, my brother, a cheater that he is, has moved to Edmonton. He's an Edmonton fan now, which I am like not even talking to him about. But yeah, definitely the Canadians. <sighs> so, Canon, uh, you gave me the word, uh, the color blue. Your favorite color is blue. Why blue? Mm -hmm. <sighs> I don't know. I, I, I'm wearing green. Uh, I've got a green situation. I was going on hoping you were going to wear blue. I was just like, she likes blue. I know I should have worn blue. I actually had a blue <laughs> shirt on, but I spilled something on his head to change. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> green it is. I'm just like, sadly going through my closet looking for something else. Um, yeah. So I just find blue very peaceful. Um, it's funny. I didn't realize my favorite color was blue until we redid our kitchen and everything. And I, the tile and everything I picked, all blue. And I went, oh, okay. I, I guess blue's my blue's my jam. So yeah, everything's blue. Mm -hmm. So your kitchen's all blue. Wow, that's an interesting yes. color for a kitchen. It's like an aqua marine blue, like a okay, more so like, like a teal kind of. Yes, like a more like a teal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I know. So it's it's <laughs> weird. Ah, okay. It's like under the sea. I've got like all these pictures of fish and stuff. I don't know. Oh, what do you well, look at that? You I got know. under the sea. I, don't. <laughs> I know. Whatever. <laughs> She's got an adventure, try. guys. She's got adventure. Yeah. Give it a try. See how it goes. It works. It works. <laughs> well, you the word adventurous, right? Like you're you're full of adventure. Mm -hmm. And you gave me the word empathetic uh, for mm -hmm. a word to describe yourself. Why that word? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's just me. If, if there, I am like a mood sucker, like I'll sit there and I can literally feel if someone's sitting beside me or even in the room, I can just feel their mood sort of slither over my skin. And if they're in bad mood, I'm just like, <gasps> and it just, it, it almost suffocates me. It's, um, I can, I can feel people's moods change. I'm just very in tune with where people are. And it's, um, 
it, it can be a little overwhelming sometimes, but I don't know. I, my husband laughs because he says, he'll ask me something and ask me a question and I'll tell him, he goes, how did you get them to tell you that? I said, I, I didn't even ask them. I just sat there and they just, just told me everything. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's just how I am. Yeah. Well, when people yeah. feel comfortable, right, they share and they open mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in a grocery store or something, does someone ever come up to you and tell you their life story or how their there's day's going? Of, there's a lot of life stories. There's a lot. I think one of the most interesting things that happened, it didn't happen to me. I had my um, my youngest and a baby Bjorn, and um, I was just loading the groceries in the trunk, and this woman stopped me, and she just went, oh, that child is just glowing. And she said, oh, the color's coming off that baby. She said, do not, um, do not stifle her. Just let her, let her be who she is. And um, some people might think, oh, it's a bunch of hooey or whatever. But I just thought, okay, cool. My, my rainbow baby here, she was just beaming out her colors. So, and she is, she's super, she's super sweet like that. I call her sunshine. So, but um, yeah. I kind of, I, I kind, I'm kind of down with it, so I, I like that. So before we went live, you mentioned snowboarding and skiing and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. So all mm -hmm. of your children are directors or coaches, mentors, and all that. So yeah, I, yeah, my, yeah, my oldest got her uh, ski license at 14. Ski license, ski instructors at 14, and she's she's just this. She's just this little dynamo. She's like five two, and she's just you know, doesn't take any prisoners. She's she's amazing. And my son teaches snowboarding, and my youngest snowboards as well. I you know living here in Alberta, it's lovely, and the mountains are crazy nice, but eh, not much else to do. So we kind of embrace that mountain lifestyle and just just rolled with it. We're so lucky where I live. It's a stone's throw from uh, where we had the Olympics, and oh. there's still a ski hill there. I can drive for five minutes and drop my kids at the top of the ski hill and they can ski for a couple hours and I can pick them up after school. And where can you say you can ski after school? Like that's pretty cool. Right. No, that is pretty cool. And that's, and that's another thing that you do with the family as well. So mm -hmm. family get togethers, right? Mm -hmm. So Candace, I want you to let people know where they can get your books and how they can reach out to you if they'd like to have you as a guest and all that. So if you'd like to just say your website and spell yeah. it out for the audio listeners. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's one of those names that you can spell it a thousand different ways. So it's um, C-A-N-D-A-C-E-M-A-C-P-H-I-E.com. So CandaceMcPhee.com. And uh, you can reach out to me through there. I've got a contact me uh, page. And then there's links to the books there as well for all, all over the world. So all the links are there too. So it's kind of the best place to go. And then you can read out. There's pictures. There's all sorts of stuff on there. So best place. So it's the one stop shop. Mm -hmm. So Kat and Cadence, I want to know what book you would recommend out of the five of them. If somebody just wanted to buy one book just to get started, would they start at the bottom or the top? Oh, well, yeah. No, you got to start with Finding Color. You got to start at the beginning. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'm a linear girl. It's just the, the stories are linear. I'm linear. It's all straightforward. And uh, if you want to get it at all, start from the beginning. And it's um it's a nice it's a nice start, easy in there. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it was a real pleasure having you tonight and sharing this amazing cup of tea and having these adventures and traveling and all of that. So do you have any trips planned for the rest of the year this year? That you're not going to take or yeah no not this year we've uh we've done and dusted our our travel year um my daughter has gone off to university so uh, that's that's been a bit of a change for us we're just getting used to being one man one one woman down here and it's um yeah, it's taking some getting used to so that's where we are just now well, thank you so much for joining me on Tea Time. I really had a pleasure sitting and getting to know you a little bit and taking me on those adventures and getting to see the world, you know, you like you said, once around the world, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and be back in a year. I, I like that saying, like, I'll be back in a year and let's see mm -hmm. what comes up in a year, right? So yeah. thank you for thank you so much for that. And thank you to the viewers and listeners out there. Thank you for your questions and your support. Miss Liz could not do this without all of you guys. Uh, we will be back Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday next week. So there are four tea times coming. Uh, we have um, Steve, uh, Mark Stephen Pearl coming on Monday. He'll be talking about a cup of tea on a Como. 
Uh, so elder care and, and that as well. And then on Tuesday, we will have a returning surprise guest. Lillian Brumpton will be coming in and we'll be talking about networking, intentional networking. And then we have on Thursday, we have Daphne McConnell, uh, McGall coming in and she's a, a sister of mine from Sacred Hearts Rising. She'll be coming in and talking about You Do You, her book. And then we have Jolie, uh, Jolie Illust Illustrant, I think I'm saying it right. And she'll be coming about uh, illustration and fantasy. So we'll, we'll be talking oh, about a lot of cool good. things. Yeah. So we'll see everybody next week, same time, same place. And we're going to serve a different type of tea, Miss Liz style with tea, tea stories and words. And we'll bring a difference to the world one cup of tea at a time. So I'll see everybody next week. Don't forget, keep serving your teas. <laughs>